Good morning. Good morning. See if you can sing it with me. <laughs> oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Good morning, my name is Mark, along with Pastor Rachel, uh, we welcome you to this time of worship to First United Methodist Church. A couple of housekeeping things before we start. Ushers are going to bring down red books. Yes, is that going to happen? Maybe it's going to happen. Red books are coming down the aisle. This is the cue. I'm just waiting to see if it lands. Here they come. And so it's not mandatory, but we invite you, if you're willing, to let us know that you're here, if you're visiting us, let us know from where, and, and if you'd like more information, how we can get that information to you, and just pass that along. We'll collect those later. Also in the pew are these blue cards. These are prayer cards. If there's a prayer concern, something for which you would like us to pray, something that, uh, you know, we would say, oh Lord, hear my prayer, that sort of thing, write it down. And uh, Rachel will collect those as we sing our opening hymn in a few moments. Um, we're taking a, an offering today for Teze. We have two young women who are going to Teze July 20, 21st, they leave, uh, traveling with our bishop and a number of other folks from our conference. And we're going to sing. We've been singing throughout the month of um, June and now into July, Teze songs at the offering. And so this morning, you'll notice when we do our time of prayer, I want to extend that. I'm not, we're not going to have you respond to each prayer request as it's prayed. The, the requests will be, will be mentioned and then there'll be just a few seconds of silence and then the next prayer concern. And then we're going to hold all those prayers together as we um, do our offering, which is also an, an act of prayer and worship. And we'll be singing that hymn that we just sang now. I, Rachel has been to Teze. In fact, you traveled with our bishop um, 10 or 11 years ago. 10 so, years ago. Okay, so she's going yeah. to uh, share a little bit about her experience there. And before she does that, Rob Gibson, what's the best way to receive a special offering for Teze? In the memo line. Yeah. You can use a check and in the memo line put Teze. Make it out to, Adder what church am I in? Make it out to First Night Methodist Church? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it's cash, just use one of the envelopes and say Teze. Credit, credit card you can do online. You can do online. You, from your phone, you can go online and pay by credit card. There's a Teze line on our donation page. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely a number of ways to support this. So we thank you in advance. But just to talk a little bit about it, I, 10 years ago, I went with our current bishop. Now, Bishop Devadar was the bishop of the Greater New Jersey Conference when I went 10 years ago, when I still lived in New Jersey. And that was my first time getting to meet uh, Bishop Devadar. So it was a wonderful experience. I was 29 years old. Um, at Taze, they take students from about uh, 15 or 16 years old um, and it used to, the cutoff used to be, I think, 29. You could go at 29 as a young person. I think they've extended that a little bit. Uh, Catherine also uh, went, I think you, the, you went twice, right? She's, Catherine's gone twice. Her, her second time was when she was 29 to get it in before she could no longer go as, as a youth. Taze accepts young people from all over the world um, on pilgrimage. They go on pilgrimage to Taze. It's this beautiful space of 
people from all different parts of Christianity come together. Um, we've been singing these songs. Uh, we gather for worship uh, a couple times a day, and these chants that you repeat over and over and over and over again, it becomes this incredibly deep meditative experience. Um, the brothers there, this Taze started as a monastic community coming out of World War II um, in an attempt to reconcile uh, between different Christian faiths. Um, so they have Protestant Christian monks and they have uh, Catholic Christian monks, they even have uh, Orthodox Christian monks, but if you ask them what their background is, they're going to tell you, I'm a Christian. They're not going to give you those specific details of which denomination they grew up in, because it's about reconciling between uh, our different faith communities within the body of Christ. But this experience, I know for me, was so important. I had just finished the tumultuous years of my 20s, where everything had changed. And I remember being in this place of, of what might be next. I was also in the process of moving to Burlington um, and had no idea what was going to be next on my plate, where God might be calling me. So I was in a place of, of deep, deep prayer. And one of my most profound spiritual experiences that I reflect back on was during my time at Taze when I'm in prayer so deeply and passionately, God, what do you need me to do? What, what are you calling me to next? What is going on next? Well, how is my life going to unfold? And I was sitting in this chapel praying at one point while I was there, and I heard God speak to me in, in a way that I, it's hard to describe when you hear the voice of God come through to you, but I heard it as a mother saying to me, child, just sit still and let me hold you. And in that moment, I just felt, okay, maybe I can let go of some of the anxiety of all the things I need to do or want to do or think I'm supposed to do and just be. And it was an incredibly profound moment. We're sending two young people to Teze. We don't know what their spiritual experience will be, but I know so many, thousands of young people every week uh, descend on this, this little monastic community um, throughout the year, and it's an incredible experience. So we invite you later in the service to give, give joyfully, give generously. This is uh, a wonderful time. We're still trying to raise $4,400 total. We're about halfway there um, and would love to, uh, to fill in the gap. Uh, would be very exciting. And we're hoping this is the first of many. Um, I actually saw a grant uh, come across this last week that I might try to uh, help support this in future years. But for this year, we still need your help. So give generously through our offering today. With that, let us go to our opening hymn, which I can't remember what it is. Little. In unity, we lift our song. Let us lift our voices and sing this day.
seated. This morning, our psalm prayer is Psalm 41. You can find it in the red hymnal on page 776 or follow along on a screen. I will read the light print and I ask you to join me in the dark print. Psalm 41. Blessed are those who consider the poor. The Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are called blessed in the land. You do not give them up to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed. In their illness, you heal all their infirmities. As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice. When will he die and his name perish? Those who come to see me utter empty words while their hearts gather mischief. When they go out, they tell it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, a deadly thing has fastened upon him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted a heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are not pleased with me and that my enemy has not triumphed over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Children, if there are any children who would like to come forward, don't have to come, but I'd like to talk to you about a very important topic today. Very important topic. And so uh, have, have a seat right over here, right down here would be good. Come on up, Julia. And I have a question for you. My question is, right now, the several of you, Catherine, you coming over or you stay in there? You don't have to come over. I was just, I didn't want to start without you. If, do you have any money on you? I have. I have a dollar. I, I have a dollar. Some people think that when you come to church late, you should have to pay. You know, if you come to church late, some people think you should have... Carol, Carol Lacey, are you late to church? You, what do you mean you guess so? With, this is the children's story. This is going to come over, come over. Come. What happened? Why are you late? You had to hang the laundry. Nice day. Okay. Well, I think we should charge her 25 cents. Do you have a quarter? Okay, have a seat. <laughs> we just made 25 cents. There you go. So some people, Rebecca, Rebecca Jakunski, are you late for church? What do you mean maybe? That's <laughs> maybe. Where have you been? It, we've, it, it started already. We've, we've already, it's the children's message. You couldn't come without both of your sandals. That's going to cost you. <laughs> 50 cents. The keys don't count. Well, maybe they would. <laughs>
Well, that's only, that's 25. Okay. Am I set? You're set. Okay. Have a seat. Try not to be late again. Well, if my dog doesn't take my shoes, I will The dog took your shoes, right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this uh, business of being late for church, you know. Hans Haeckel. Hans? Uh, sir. <laughs> Are you just getting here? Yeah. What do you mean, yeah? We started like 20 minutes ago. I had a flat tire on North Avenue. You had a flat tire on North Avenue. Well, there's a new tax. If you come late to church, it's going to cost you a dollar. Okay. I guess I forgot my wallet. <laughs> you forgot your wallet. You forgot? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> what did you just say? This is his wife back here. She's, I think she said, I can pay for him. <laughs> is that what you said? <laughs> you got the dollar? Look. Go ahead. What do you think about Is this a good plan? Why not? Just a second, Catherine. Why isn't... Thank you, Hans. You can... You what? We have more beers at house. You do? Three. Three. Yep. Let's go out for ice cream. She said no. she had more wheels at her house, so she was giving her a wheel. Oh. oh. Hans. <laughs> Catherine was giving you a wheel. She has three wheels at her house. <laughs> okay, now I'd like you to look at a picture. Can we see the picture? I'd like you to can you, come to where you can see this picture on the screen. See this picture? Can you see it okay? Do you know what that is? It's Route 2A. It's Route 2A. It's a bridge. Yes. How's that it's bridge really looking? Bad. How is it looking? Really bad. It's a little bit. It's, a, I bet you've all gone over that bridge or under it, I'm willing to say. Um, well, maybe not. No. How is it looking? How much would you pay to go over that bridge to get it fixed? Bye. Just a second, Catherine. How much would you pay? A lot of dollars? How much would you pay? How much would you be willing to pay? A lot of dollars. I only have like four dollars. You have four dollars. Okay, so would you give all your four dollars to fix the bridge? Probably only three dollars. You'd only give three dollars. What would you do with the other dollar? Give it to Hans. Do you think there should be a tax if people come late to church? No, Mark, I think we should give back that money. <laughs> Luca, would you find Carol? She's right over there. Can you bring that back to her, please? <laughs> Ruby, would you find, where is uh, Becca? Uh, that other person. She's right there. See, she's got her hand up. Yeah. Hans, you don't get this. There's a, a place in the Bible where people ask Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes? What do you think? Is it good to pay taxes? Do you have to pay taxes at home? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not, maybe not you personally, but you're paying taxes at home, right? And so, <laughs> you do. All right. You have a lot of things. They turn blue. I'm lost. Let's, we're going to pray. And I'd like you to think today about what you pay for. What you pay for. What money is about. Uh, I think you've had your say. We're going to pray in just a second, okay? And... And, and maybe ask, what belongs to me and what belongs to God? Let's pray together. For the stuff we have, oh God, thank you. For toys and money that helps us buy things we enjoy. Help us to know what is ours, what belongs to others, and what belongs to you. 
We thank you for the gift of Jesus and ask your blessing on us in his name. Amen. You don't have to pay taxes if you're late for church. At least not yet. All right. Well, I mean, a hundred years from now, when I'm not here, I don't, who knows what's going to happen, you know? But so far, you can come late to church. Not too late, though. You don't want to miss the sermon. Okay, you can go sit down. Go. <laughs> go. Catherine. Earth to Catherine. Over here. We're going to sing, uh, you, you can sing from there if you want. We'd like, we'd like everybody to sing along. We're, this is maybe words that you know, uh, they're in the hymnal, but it's maybe a different tune. You may have heard it, may have not heard it, so Mark and I are going to lead it. And as you figure out the tune, or if you already know it, we welcome you to sing along with us. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless, flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of I love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful, beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages, messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal, be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet each treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all, only all for Our first scripture is from Leviticus 22, verses 17 to 20. You can follow along in the Pew Bible on page 109. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and all the people of Israel, and say to them, When anyone of the house of Israel or of the aliens residing in Israel presents an offering, whether in payment of a vow or as a free will offering that is offered to the Lord as a burnt offering. To be acceptable in your behalf, it shall be a male without blemish of the cattle or the sheep or the goats. You shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable in your behalf. The second scripture is from Luke. 
Luke 20, verses 20 to 26 on page 84 in the New Testament. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be honest in order to trap him by what he said so as to hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you are right in what you say and teach, and you so show deference to no one, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius, whose head and whose title does it bear? They said, the emperor's. He said to them, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to trap him by what he said. And being amazed by his answer, they became silent. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In July, we're talking about politics through the eyes of our faith. The United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. In April of 2016, two luxury condominiums were sold near Manhattan's Central Park for less than half the price of their actual value. Under normal circumstances in New York State and federal law, when such a sale is made within a family, say the parents want to gift a property, a home or property, to a, a, a child or grandparents to a grandchild. The sale would come under the heading of a gift and there would be a gift tax associated with the sale. And the tax for the gift is determined by the difference between the market value of the property and the actual sale price. And if the difference is greater than $14,000 the tax liability can be as high as 40%. In this particular situation, the value of the two condominiums was $790,000 and $800,000, respectively. The sale price for both was $350,000. The gift tax on one would be 40% of $440,000, and the other would be 40% of $450,000. The gift tax liability then at 40% would be $176,000 on one and $180,000 on the other. Records indicate, however, that no gift tax was paid on either property. And the reason for this has to do with the detail, the complexities, the intricacies of the tax laws that real estate developers have available to them. The family in question is the Trump family. Mr. Trump sold these two properties to his son, Eric, as he was on the cusp of securing the Republican nomination for president. In April, excuse me, in August of 2015, Mr. Trump was on Face the Nation and he said, I fight like hell to pay as little taxes as possible. Don't we all? I mean, who, who blames him? I don't want to pay more taxes than I'm liable for. 
we used to do our own taxes, Jan and I, and, and then um, because of something that happened, we had, to, we had a, an accountant look at the taxes, and we found out that we'd been overpaying significantly, and so for three years, we got money back from the government. It was so cool. <laughs> I got like $1,000 back for three years. And, um, but the accountant said, yeah, but this is not good. Because while you don't have the money for all that time, you, you, know, you, have no, you don't want to pay more tax than you have to pay. Pay your fair share. But you don't need to pay more. The Talmudic scholar Rabba said, the government cuts down trees and builds bridges and we cross them. This, writes Dr. Erica Brown, suggests to us the self-serving nature of taxes. Jan and I happened to be going under that bridge, and Jan looked up and she said, Whoa, now the steel looks to be in great shape. It's just the road surface that's the problem. And until we have a car that can ride on the steel girders, I want the road surface to be in good shape too, right? The Babylonian Talmud compiled from the 2nd to the 6th century of our era, speaks of poll taxes in Persia. The population was divided into four tax brackets, each bracket responsible for a different amount of tax. And one way to pay the poll tax was to sell a date palm tree. The problem was, in Persia, and we're going to take one part of it, let's take, for example, the part that is currently Iraq, there are four different kinds of date palm trees that grew during that time. One tree grew that raised about 30 pounds of dates a year and the other 126 pounds of dates a year. Now, I have two tomato bushes in my backyard and I'm thinking about just selling them to the city of Burlington in lieu of property tax because the instructions said these were big tomatoes. What are those called? Barnstormers? Say what? Beef, beef steak? Yeah, whatever. The big ones, you know? But you see, in order to pay the tax, you say, well, but what kind of date palm is it? Is it the kind that yields only 30 pounds of dates a year or the kind that yields 120 pounds of dates? How much sunshine was there? How much rainfall was there this year? Are you a good farmer? Did you take good care of the plant? I was, I was reading about this in an article by a guy named David M. Goodblatt in the Journal of Economic and Social History of the Orient. He wrote 60 pages on the poll tax in Persia during the Sasanian dynasty. Either he needs more to do or I do. I mean... <laughs> And I'll be honest, I didn't read all 60 pages, but it's at home waiting for me. Taxes are complicated, and few people like to talk about them, which is why we use euphemisms like mission shares in the New England Conference. We're not comfortable with apportionment. It sounds too much like a tax. Governments and bureaucracies, both sacred and secular, are dependent upon people to give money. Come late, I discovered, not, not, I mean, I, this didn't happen to me, but I read about it and I was forewarned. Come late to Medicare, it's gonna cost you more. And so four months before you're eligible to sign up, you start getting stuff from people that I had no idea were such good friends of mine and so worried about my well-being trying to get me to sign on with them so that I was signed up to welfare in plenty of time. Don't come late to welfare, I tell you. I mean, not welfare, but Medicare, where there's a tax. But we can't make people give money, so in churches we have pledges where what we try to do is make you feel obligated to give an amount that you determine. And then we can call you up, hey, you haven't fulfilled your, your pledge. Municipalities ask people to vote on bond issues for things that they need but are afraid to raise taxes for. <laughs> you know, you could just raise the taxes except that I ran on no tax increase. No tax, so we're going to have bonds. Get people to support things. 
Leviticus speaks of offerings as a payment of a vow or a free will offering. When you bring an offering, this is an offering. You are offering this. Boy, what Seinfeld could do with this sort of thing. We pay for utilities such as water and electricity. Yesterday afternoon, I was working on my sermon at my computer, and all of a sudden, a bolt of lightning and thunder sounded like it hit me. And in a flash, the power was gone. So I don't know where you live. I know it didn't happen all over the city, but where I live, the power was out. And uh, later that day, Jan and I went out for something, and up on North Prospect Street, there they were, three Burlington electric utility trucks, very high up in the air, uh, working on the power lines. I think that transformer got hit. Well, I want to have electricity. I want to have power. It's not a tax that we pay, but if you don't pay... Well, you don't get the electricity or water. So in Luke, the scribes and chief priests are trying to set a trap for Jesus by asking him about taxes. But the question of lawfulness of the Roman tax system has more teeth in it than we might first recognize. How much tax is it ethical for a government or a bureaucracy to demand of its citizens and who makes the determination. I I wonder what the amount would have been before Kathy would have said, nope, he's not worth it. (laughs) If I had said, that's going to cost you $10,000, I wonder if she would have said, Mark, I've got the credit card right here, or I'll write you a check, or maybe she'd say, Hans, you're on your own, honey. We're all familiar with the term gentrification. That's what happens when the neighborhood that is home suddenly becomes attractive to a lot of other folk who have a lot more money than the folks who currently live there. And they start buying up property and the value goes up. It goes up to the point where people who live there, whose home it is, can't live there anymore. Happens I mean, I know there's concern about it happening in the South End now. You read in the newspaper, are, 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 is that area of the city going to be gentrified? Taxation is the cost associated with living in community, but how do we determine how much any individual should pay? How come Carol got in for only 25 cents and Rebecca cost her 50 cents and Hans was up to a dollar? Who decides that? Who do we trust? So Jesus says, well, I'd like to see the coin. And we automatically assume, given the fact that the image and the inscription on the coin is that of the emperor, that of Caesar, then we hear Jesus say, well, give to Caesar, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. We assume that Jesus is saying, you've got to pay your taxes. I mean, that's the way it goes. I don't know how many of you have read Thomas Paine's Common Sense. It's a great book. So he writes this book about English, the English system of government and the monarchy. And he says, even in its best state, government is a necessary evil. We impose it on ourselves. And then using a biblical image, Paine writes these words, government like dress is the badge of lost innocence. (laughs) If the impulses of conscience were clear, he writes, and uniformly and irresistibly obeyed, we would need no other lawgiver. Society, he says, promotes our happiness, but government, he says, affects us negatively because all it is designed to do is restrain our, our vices. Don't go faster than you should go. Stay on that side of the road. Don't hog the road. Don't take it all for yourself. And so, writes Thomas Paine, we must, as a result of government, surrender up a part of our property to furnish the means to protect the rest of our property. 
In other words, we are constrained to pay taxes either in the form of first fruits of our harvest, the perfect animal from our herd, the healthy date palm tree, or cold cash that is hard earned, because absent that constraint, not only would we fight like hell not to pay and subsequently watch our bridges crumble, our airports and train and bus stations languish, to say nothing of having the lawns mowed in the meridians of our highways, but basically, for our fighting like hell, the world would go to hell. Apart from constraints, we can't be trusted to take care of it. The philosophical and political battle that is as old as humankind itself is this. What is it that government is required to provide for its citizens? John Adams and Thomas Jefferson went at this tooth and nail. They debated it. Moses ponders it. How many judges do we need? It's not how much are we willing to pay as much as it is for what are you willing to pay? John Kennedy tries to bridge the gap between the, 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 the joy of society and the potential perils of government with this oft-repeated line, ask not what your country, read government, can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, for your government. What are you called upon to do? And for many people, there's less a sense of what our government is doing for us and more a sense of what our government is doing to us. And you don't have to go very far on Google to find people who are upset at churches because we ask for money. What are we doing? What is the church doing to you? When I was a kid growing up, the church I grew up in, we had a pew tax. It's right in the Methodist rules. You don't have to pay to sit down. You may have to pay if you come late, but you don't have to pay to sit down. No pew tax. Jesus receives the challenge. He takes this challenge up. And boy, the scribes and the chief priests think they've got him. They've got him. But he leaves the question open, really, about what belongs to the emperor. When Israel demanded to have a king, the prophet Samuel warned the people what would happen. And here's what happens. Here's what government does. The government takes your children, in those days your sons, and makes them soldiers, your daughters, and makes them concubines, takes your produce, sells it to make implements of war, will take the best of your crops and fields and give it to their cronies, and will take your servants and make them do his work. And then Samuel says the people will essentially become the slaves of the king. In other words, the slaves of their government. Is it lawful to pay taxes? Well, it certainly is expedient. I had a good friend of mine, a retired professor of religion, who resented the amount of his taxes that was used for military spending, and so he withheld that portion. After about eight or nine years, he got notice that there was a lien on his pension. The government was taking his pension, but my friend had hedged his bets. He was disciplined enough to take the amount of tax and put it in a special account and not touch it. And so when he got the notice about his pension, he paid the tax. He fully expected the long arm and firm grasp of the IRS to find him and to put the squeeze on, so he was prepared. But was he really honest in his protest? Was he really willing to pay the price? Is it lawful? Is it ethical? Is it consistent with the teachings of Jesus to spend as much as our country spends on guns and soldiers and all the implements of war in our possession? But then a society can't allow for persons to pay taxes only for the goods and services that are attractive to them. You can't just pay for what is consistent with your values. That's not community. Is it lawful? Is it ethical? Is it consistent with the teachings of Jesus 
to spend as much as the church in America spends on steeples, stained glass, and pipe organs. Right? We struggle with that. You've got to meet somewhere. It's nice to meet in a place that's beautiful. And so taxes for highways or altars for bridges or baptistries, Jesus does not solve this for us. There is no formula, but perhaps while a lot of attention is given to the implicit permission to pay taxes to the government, the more important part of Jesus' response has to do with what belongs to God. What belongs to God? It's one thing to fight like hell, not to pay any more taxes than is required, but it's another thing to dismiss the larger and the deeper, deeper spiritual issues. How much of what I have is really mine? How much of it is mine? Mine to own. What is my responsibility to be stewards, to be a steward of the blessings I enjoy and the possessions that I claim? Luke tells us those who questioned Christ became silent following his response. And they didn't know what to say. Maybe it's the Methodist equivalent of putting it out to a study committee to report at the next general conference or something like that. They were silent. And you know, maybe we should be too. Maybe we should sit in prayerful reflection about our priorities, about the cost of being in community, you know, as, as, as Christians here and as, as people in in this area where we live, to think prayerfully about the cost of being together. And really what Jesus leaves folks with and the reason they're so quiet is because much more important than what we are cheating the government out of it's not the government that's being cheated. It's God. We pray together. God, even as we fight like hell, may we pray as if heaven depended on it to know what's really important. Help us not to fall into the trap of thinking that we can avoid the complexities and the intricacies, the deep struggles and the deeper joys that are part of being community together. Thank you for sending us someone who did not give us the formula, but invited us into the conversation. For one who doesn't mean to completely silence us, but to challenge us, to inspire us, to be mindful, prayerful, honest, and empathetic and to be slow to pass judgment on others before we take full account of ourselves and our motives. Thank you that now we can continue in prayer together. Let us lift up now these prayers that were written down to be shared with the congregation. Continued prayers for someone's granddaughter, Sophie, for her continued healing following successful surgery on Thursday. Prayers for people in our community who are struggling with addictions of all kinds. Prayers for Julian, 
a teenage boy with an abusive father and a drug-addicted mother. Prayers for the feasibility research team as they work to find new ways to financially sustain this congregation. And prayers for Lauren and Lakeisha as they prepare to pilgrimage to Teze this month. We lift up these things in prayer. The offering is a prayer. It's a prayer, potentially, something that we enter into humbly, joyfully. But really, when we pray, we need to remember that the prayer bleeds into this because offerings in some ways are the prayers in action. And so we're gonna pray uh, as we give our gifts and our tithes for these concerns and um, for those who are on pilgrimage of all sorts, all kinds, pilgrimages of recovery, of, of hope, of struggle, of spiritual quests. Let's give, and as we give, let's continue to pray. Hear my prayer, O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. my prayer, O oh Lord, hear my prayer, come and listen to me, O oh Lord, hear my prayer, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. may we be as prayerful about our use of money as we are about our health concerns. May we be as aware of our need for financial healing as we are physical and spiritual healing. May we be inspired today 
to spend a few moments praying not only for physical needs, but for spiritual courage to be honest, to be true, to listen, and to be fully alive, to follow Jesus, to love as Jesus loves, to bring hope as Jesus offers us hope, to pray together, not only in Jesus' name, but in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us I've got a few announcements for us for our life together. I'm going to start with this. If you're wondering why I'm talking funny, it's because I've got this new piece of plastic in my mouth that I'm trying to figure out how to talk around. My jaw's been hurting for about a decade, and I'm trying to fix it. So that's to save a bunch of questions later on. That's why I'm talking funny. Um, so a few announcements today. Um, I see Lauren back there. I know she's going to be uh, doing root beer floats. Uh, so if you further ways of supporting this Taze pilgrimage, there will be root beer floats for sale at the end of the service. It's a great day for root beer floats. Get your float and sit out on the lawn in the sunshine. It's beautiful. Um, I want to make sure that we know and, and everybody gets on their calendars the potluck pig roast in two weeks. Um, it's not going to be at the waterfront this year because that pavilion is out of commission or some such thing. It's going to be at Oak Ledge Park down further south uh, in, in Burlington. So look for that. The announcement is in your bulletin, but make sure you get it on the calendar. It's a fun event. We're inviting all the youth to come this year. I might play some games beforehand with them too. So just so you know, come and play. Um, and finally, I want to lift up, uh, as I have been the last few weeks, and I will be for the foreseeable future, um, we have a team who's working on figuring out what is feasible for our congregation going forward. We're researching, we're trying to figure out things to um, really make this location um, be financially uh, sustainable for us. We've come to the conclusion we can't afford the building as it is or with the financial resources that we just right now have available to us, but we have incredible assets here. And so we're trying to figure out how how to utilize these assets. Um, we're in the process of writing uh, a, a document that, that gives information about the history of our church and the vision of this and the mission and what, what we're trying to accomplish. And we're hoping that developers come back to us with ideas of how to develop this property in an effort to have a business model that sustains this congregation. And it's exciting work. Um, today, we have some prayer cards. And actually, could I get a couple, can I get my, my youth, Abby and Dina, will you help me out, um, to pass these out? Um, these are prayer cards that we invite you to pray along with us, just give them to everybody, um, to pray along with us as we're doing this process. So I encourage you, take this, maybe put it on a bathroom mirror, you see it in the morning, or, or maybe by your... Uh, your teapot or your coffee pot to remember at some point in time during the day to lift us up in prayer as, as a community. Um, this talks about, you know, we're asking for wisdom and, and empowerment and, and for the Holy Spirit to be in our midst as we find ways to make this church community something that will last far into the future. I've got to say one of the cool things last week uh, for our paper, I met with... Um, John Bolton, who's kind of like our, our church historian. And I sat down with him and learned some of the history of this congregation. Do you know that we're about 200 years old right now? About 200 years ago, in the 18-teens, a small group of people started meeting in houses. And then they moved to a, a school building and incorporated in, in 1823. 
the, the, um, the church became an official Methodist congregation. And it's really fascinating. Once we're done with some of this, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to get bits and pieces out to you to read. It's still in draft form. But it's fascinating stuff, and the history of this church is so rich. I hope that what we're doing now, others somewhere down the road in 25 or 50 years or 75 years, will look back at this time, at this moment in this church's history and go, ah, it's because of the courage of the congregation in 2017 and 2018 that this church still exists. That's why we're doing what we're doing. So we invite you to pray with us. Be with us on this journey. Hold us in prayer as we do the research necessary to make this a viable congregation for years and years to come. So thank you for all that support. Um, We're ready now, I think, to go on to our closing hymn, which in the bulletin says one thing, and I don't know where that is, and um, but it's actually called this, Is It Lawful to Pay Taxes? Mark found this, um, this hymn in, a, uh, in an article that was titled Rendered, Rendering to Caesar and to God. But this is the actual name of the hymn. I think you'll find the music uh, familiar, and you'll just read along on the screen. Let us pray and sing. we are called upon every day to give taxes in one way or another, to give our due, to give something of ourselves, and to remember what goes to Caesar and what goes to God. Let us remember that we are God's, and we give to God what we have so that God can use these things to nourish our whole world. So let us go from this place in, with the blessing of God, Son, Holy Spirit. May we be blessed. Go out into the world and do good. The peace of Christ be with you.
Let us pass the peace with one another this day.